Well, Esmond and Larby discovered Martin on Clapham Common uh, being a referee in a football match. Offside! Oh, and being extremely arrogant. And this was just an amateur football match, but this guy in real life was awful. All right. You've asked for this. <laughs> oh, don't be ridiculous. I'm beyond your jurisdiction. Nobody is beyond my jurisdiction on this pitch. This is a public park. All right. You've asked for this. <laughs> just appalling, uh, officious little thing. <laughs> and so uh, they thought we'll write that kind of character. I will give it to Dickie Briars because if anybody can take the curse off this frightful little man, it'll be him. Kissing and very oversensitive with, of course, Peter Egan and Plenty Wilton. He was so extreme. He was so pernickety. His outrageous ghastliness that made them laugh. Yes, Martin? I've got the milk on. Good. <laughs> In other words, I am making the oval team. I've got a gin and tonic. After I've made the oval clean, I should be taking it upstairs, which signifies that the bedroom light will be going off in 15 minutes' time. Do I make myself perfectly clear? Perfectly. Good. Goodbye. Why she was married to him, I have no idea. And people for years afterwards used to say, why did you marry him? I said, because actually it was written in the script. <laughs> By the way, I've still no news about that lamppost business, by the way. I don't think they'll be happy till someone kills himself. I really don't. I used my obsessiveness to be a success in the characters I played. A great many of them have been obsessive about what they do and very nervous, uh, energised people. And I thought, well, I'm 55, you know, I wanted to sort of go back to rep in a way. I want to now expand as far as I can in a, the range of characters I can as far as I can before the end of the career. And uh, I got offered by a, a friend of ours, John Gale, to go down to Chichester to play Lord Foppington in The Relapse. And my younger brother in the play was played by John Sessions. And that, of course, is when my good mate, Mr. Branner, came down to see me, been surrounded in my restoration garb, and saw Dickie, and thought, um, this man hasn't had his potential fully stretched. Within a year, he'd formed the Renaissance Company, Ken, that is, and cast Dickie as Malvolio. How now? Malvolio? Sweet lady. You could smell that he was hungry to do something oh. that challenged every bit of him as an actor, oh. as it were, he could laugh, he could cry, he could shout, he could be funny, he could be angry. All these things were there, and, and, uh, and uh, he took the opportunity with, with both hands. Some are born great, huh? some achieve greatness. What sayest thou? And some have greatness thrust upon them. Heaven restore thee! to move out of that very seemingly secure medium and go back into the theatre and work with an untried young man called Kenneth Branagh at the time and do Shakespeare was a very brave move. After we finished Twelfth Night, he said, uh, would you like to have a go at King Lear? Well, I went rather pale and I said, now, Ken, you know, I'm terrific in Malvolio, lovey, but now you're talking about the biggies. I'm not at all certain about that. Ken was wonderful because he's a hands-on director. He's, he does one-to-one -one directing. He takes you in a room and really talks to you. He wants the best thing out of you. And to get me as a middle-class boy from the suburbs to open up this enormous emotional power which Lear has to have, it's the you know, complete opposite of sitcom. Sitcom acting, good sitcom acting. We're talking the best here. We're talking David Jason, Richard Briers, Paul Eddington, God rest his soul, Arthur Lowe, you know, John Lemez. Yeah, these people are, are prime contenders for doing Shakespeare. Go in peace, good general, but tell thy sovereign lady this. If she doth bite her thumbs at us, even do we back unto her our thumbs be back. <laughs> Don't call us, we'll call you. In this profession, as we all know, the better work you do, Shakespeare, Chekhov, Ibsen, the less you get paid. <laughs> I say, that's new. Makes it even easier to help yourself. So, I was very lucky in having an advertising career. I mean, the greatest year I had regarding advertising was when, not that long ago, about six years ago, I played King Lear for about 280 quid a week. But I got the coffee bean commercial. That one. Richard, final rehearsal. First, you savour the aroma. Aroma. <laughs> Lovely. Now do I do it? Not yet. Then you enjoy the rich, smooth taste. Taste, right. Ah, delicious. And that paid for the entire year, income tax, corporation tax, BAT, 
up and I was able to play Leah without, any, without going into capital, which is very important not to go into capital when you're my age. <laughs> There's a certain snobbish divide um, between the classics and contemporary work, sometimes between the theatre and television, and I've always admired the way uh, Richard uh, helped break those down. The films that Kenneth suddenly offered me, I mean, were... I couldn't believe it. I mean, suddenly, uh, from television and the West End stage, to be doing a scene with Denzel Washington. Good Senor Leonardo, are you come to meet your trouble? The fashion of the world is to avoid cost, and you encounter it. Never came trouble to my house in the likeness of your grace. <laughs> I'd have had a lot of money on the fact that it would never happen in my life to me, but it did. And then, of course, there was Frankenstein. And I was there saying hello to Robert De Niro, which was a bit of a shock. I went to see uh, Robert De Niro when I was trying to cast him in, in Frankenstein. It was a bit of a, a, bit of a wooing process. So uh, they sat there and watched three or four of Ken's films. Tush, tush, man, never fleer and jest at me. I speak not like a dotard nor a fool. I say thou hast belied mine innocent child. You say not right, old man. My lord, my lord, I'll prove it on his body if he... Wait, I don't know. We get to the scene where Leonardo, Richard Breyer's character, is berating Don Pedro. Thou hast killed my child! It's very moving in that scene and, and pretty butch, actually, for Dick. He said he frightened himself that day. He was so, so butch, darling. I will be heard. And shall. And De Niro said, what you do? He said, uh, who plays the old guy? So uh, Ken, Ken said, that's Dickie Breyer. I said, oh, yeah, he's a good actor. Is he a nice guy? He said, oh, yes, he's very nice indeed. OK, yeah. OK, if you want him in, you can get him the part. Victor. Frankenstein. When they did Frankenstein, uh, uh, Dickie and... Uh, Robert De Niro had many scenes together, and that is one of, the, I think, one of the greatest conjunctions of actors from completely different worlds. You know, I'd been working with Robert De Niro for a while on the on the picture when Dickie came to do his bits, and I said, "Listen, he's a lovely fella, Mr. Uh, Mr. De Niro, John Cleese, you to call him. Uh, Mr. De Niro is lovely, uh, and he's very teasable, very nice, bright, funny lad. And uh, amongst the things he likes to do is he likes to keep the camera running, and often he will repeat the line that he's saying." Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. There was a, this small scene when he has to, the old man says, come in, come in, I know you're there, the famous scene in Frankenstein, and he's lurking outside. Ken said, look, when you say, come in, I know you're there, don't be frightened, he said, you may have to say quite a lot more. And of course, Dickie, a man who likes his cues, and boom, you know, he keeps ripping the line, love. I don't want to come in. I don't want to come in, love. So I said, what do you mean? Because I don't want to, you know, don't want to suddenly ad lib. I'm not very good at ad libbing. I have to painstakingly learned. He said, well, he has to be made to come in. I said, you mean he won't come in on his cue? He said, no, no, no. He's got to be in the mood, so you've got to persuade him, for real, to come in the room. So I'm saying, oh, come in, my dear. No, I know you're there, dear fellow. You mustn't be frightened. Come. Come in. Uh, afterwards, he said, I mean, normally, love, I'd be looking at their lips, and then as soon as they finish talking, I know it's my cue. But with him, I couldn't even say the bloody lips, love. So I'm looking at you, I thought, if he gets any nearer, he could, he could nudge me. He could give me a nudge on the thigh, love, and I'll know where to speak. Uh, he's very good, though, isn't he? Very good. I'm glad you finally came in. A man shouldn't have to hide in the shadows. Better that way for me. It worked out in the end. So he keeps you on your toes, love, doesn't he? Keeps you on your toes. <laughs> To seek the Lord Hamlet, there he is. When I played Polonius to Ken's Hamlet, I rang him about six weeks before shooting and I said, You've got this lovely scene which is normally cut of Polonius and his servant, a tiny part called Ronaldo. Dickie had gone on, I think, endlessly, it seems to me, about the need for, he said, uh, Who are you going to cast as uh, Ronaldo, love? Because, you know, you've got to have somebody with a bit of, you know, bit of bite to them, but it's such a bloody awful part. Nobody wants to do it, you know. He said, I'm going on, I'm bloody on. I need somebody who's going to give me something, but I also don't want them standing there getting bored. I said, let me think about it. There or took in rows. And then I rang him up and said, uh, look, I, uh, you know, I'm sorry. It's a foreigner, unfortunately. I said, do you mind if uh, Gerard Depardieu does it? Oh, my God, he goes, oh, my God. So I fell off the phone in the kitchen. He said, well, that's done it now, because I'd be completely intimidated, completely intimidated. The man's a genius. I can't. He said, it's the second time you've done this. I can't, you know, first it was De Niro and I was blind, and now it's Depardieu and he doesn't speak English. It's fantastic, isn't it? So they jetted the great man in, 
from his vineyard in France, and, and we had nine hours to do it, because he was going to get the jet back at the end of the day. Now, that's quite daunting. I saw him yesterday. What other day? I must have lost several pounds that day, and I had all the responsibility of all the lines, and I was saying, so and so and so and so, 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 you understand, Ronaldo? I said, I do, my lord. Very good, my lord. But that was, again, an honor. I mean, who would know that I would be playing with that, the greatest French actor in the world? I mean, you know, unbelievable. It's sort of seeming odd that the bloke from The Good Life was acting with Taxi Driver and, uh, you know, Jean de Florette, you know, it's still quite funny. Let's have one of the slave girls brought up here. Have ourselves some sport, eh? Sir Charles, I, I do not think that will be quite right and proper. Right and proper? Right and proper? I know what's right and proper, man. I'm a damn baronet, man. Come on, Josiah. Don't be a pineapple. Let's stir the stock. It's lovely playing with villains occasionally, because, uh, you know, one, one, is, one plays likeable things and one tries to amuse the public in a nice way. So when I got a part uh, quite recently in Morse, they dyed my hair very cleverly, so I looked really awful. And I thought, I'm going to play this part very quiet, I'm speak very quietly. I really do control the future, Shelley. Dennis can be master, but only if you do what I want. It's like all the, the nicest guys. He, he plays villains wonderfully well. You Americans are so naive. What the hell do you mean? Dennis once had an affair with my wife. Never told you that, did he? He ruined my marriage. I've waited a long time for the chance to ruin his. Thank you for being so obliging. Not quite so difficult as they seem, because, of course, in comedy it's very fast and you've got to think very quickly. With a villain, you can be very, very quiet and really. And pause, pause, pause. What a presence. You know, all those tricks you use so you can think slower. <laughs> They're such fun to play a really horrible part. There is always a twinkle in his eye. He likes a bit of danger. He likes putting himself on the line. He'll moan uh, for the UK about it. He's one of life's great comic whingers. He's got a wonderful Hancockian uh, streak, uh, but uh, it's all a front for somebody who continues to get, even at the ancient age he now uh, occupies, uh, immensely excited. He has all the passion, all the excitement, all the vigor of a young actor. If there were more people with your spirit in this country, we'd still have an empire. <laughs> we'll do that next year. There you are. <laughs> we're on the way up already, you see? But Tom and Barbara and their bizarre life. It may be bizarre, Jerry, but it's a good life. Yes, that's it. That's it. Here's to the good life. Life in the Freezer continues next Sunday at 7.30. For next tonight on BBC One, Richard Bryars stars and there are ultimatums on all fronts as life gets even more complicated for the monarch of the Glen.